This morning has been filled with a series of thought-provoking conversations. Uh, to round out these discussions, we now want to turn our attention to the role of diversity in the age of digital media. Please join me in welcoming on stage Monica Lozano, Chairman of the Latinos and Society Program at the Aspen Institute and former Chairman of U.S. Hispanic Media. Monica is also the former publisher and CEO of La Opinión, the largest and most influential Hispanic newspaper in the country. Also with us is Shirley Velasquez. She's the executive editor of People in Español.com and Chica, an English language vertical about the lives of American Latinos on People.com. An expert in pop culture and digital content, Shirley speaks publicly about the lives of American Latinos and the importance of empowering women in the workplace. And finally joining us will be Michelle Salcedo, the desk editor at the Associated Press. Michelle is a member of the board at the National Press Club and is a past president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Yeah. Yeah. Erica Gonzalez, reporter and anchor with NBC4, is back for this conversation. The floor is yours, hey. Erica. <laughs> I can sit close to you. All right. <laughs> okay. Vamos a seguir platicando, no? Okay. All right. So, same as our last panel, I'll kind of pose some questions that anybody can chime in on, and then we'll try to get to some specific questions based on uh, your career paths and your different organizations. So, let's talk broadly about some of the benefits of a more diverse, a more inclusive media. Mm -hmm. Open for anybody to chime in. Sure, I, I'll start because um, it was interesting coming off of what Monica here was talking about, which has to do with the demographic changes. We all understand the power and the potential of the Hispanic market, the fact that we're the second largest, we're the second fastest growing, we consume media, um, over index and everything social, video, mobile, and yet there is a fairly significant disparity between um, seeing Latinos in media versus our consumption of media. And there's lots of studies that talk about how our image, in fact, it was um, Nina who said, you can't be what you don't see. Right, and right. if we don't see ourselves in media, and if we aren't the people who are actually making the decisions about what goes on the air, um, we have this disconnect between how America views our community and how we ourselves understand our contributions. Shirley, want to chime in on that? Yeah, I, thank you. Thank you for having me, first of Absolutely. all. Absolutely. And um, it's very interesting because I now work at Time Inc. And um, it's one of the companies where I've actually seen um, diversity in action. And I work with a lot of people um, who are Latino, who are of Asian origin, who are African American, and who are, you know, who are at top executive levels. So um, I see the difference between that and other places where I've worked where that hasn't been the case. And essentially, for me, it boils down to having that advocate in the room to say, you know, this is a story, or this is a vertical, or this is a, you know, a series that really speaks to a group of people that that does not see itself represented in mainstream media, and in the you know in the time that I've been there, I've just seen that kind of content become more important, more and more important, partly because of the stats you you just mentioned mm -hmm. and the person before just mentioned, but partly because we. Um, have also shown up to consume that content and have been have been just voicing our opinions more and 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 interacting more. So I am seeing a change, you know, slow to come, but still, it's, it, I think it's in the midst of happening. Michelle, Shirley, let me ask you: Do you think that it's because you already have good people at the top to where it makes you a little bit more comfortable to even go and pose that discussion and say, "We need to be on this." I think that if you don't have the leadership at the top and the commitment mm -hmm. at the top, it's not going to trickle, trickle down. down. Right. It's, much easy, it's much more difficult mm -hmm. to be at a lower level and try to push up and try to affect that change uh, from the bottom. Mm -hmm. It can be done, but it takes much, much longer. And going to Shirley's point and, and Monica's point as well, um, if you, you can have people in those leadership positions, but if you don't have Latinos or Latinas throughout the organization to help management figure out how you're going to implement that plan. I mean, I think people have been saying, organizations have. I got it. Thank you. Yes. Have been saying for 30 years, um, 
not starting, but certainly recognized by Time Magazine. I think it was in the 70s, the year of the Hispanic. <laughs> Um, you know, we're still kind of we're still kind of waiting for that year, and we keep being told that it's our year and it's our year. But somehow, the year goes by, and we're still kind of in the same place. So, if you don't have that middle management layer, and you don't have a pipeline of people coming up, um, you know, sort of extending your hand back and bringing them into the organization, especially larger organizations like Tribune, like Time, like the AP. Um, you're not going to, it's not going to be easy to implement mm -hmm. those plans and mm -hmm. it's going to take much, much longer. Let me also pose this question and anybody can chime in on this. What do you all see as some of the greatest failures of contemporary media when it comes to providing for their audiences, the communities? They should reflect the community that they serve. Mm -hmm. I would, I think, um, I think about it in two ways because on the one hand, you know, major media companies, like all companies, recognize the demographics. They know that they have to be relevant and, um, you know, be able to reach audiences with content that they care about. And so they're they're trying to find ways in which they can um, begin to move in that direction. But the the measurements very often lead them to do things that are about engagement. Mm -hmm. So um, is it a story that gets more eyeballs as opposed to is it a story that really empowers communities, that provides information that will benefit the individual who's consuming it? And I think that there's a real tension there between following the eyeballs versus doing things that are issue oriented, that are advocacy mm -hmm. based, that will elevate um, our community by giving them the information that is empowering. And, and that is clearly one of the tensions that's going on in media today. Can we talk about, um, because we're talking about media, the, would you all say that there are unique differences in, in, in our business, in media, for Latinas to be able to ascend the ranks? Is it something different about our industry, or would you say it's the same, it's the same set of challenges for Latinas across the board, no matter the industry, or is it different for our industry? I think that because media, especially, um, has such a powerful message that the person who can, the, the person or the group of people who controls that message, um, people don't want to give that up. So. I think that that makes it a little bit more uh, difficult because the stakes are higher. You are going to, a Latina is going to bring her perspective into the news meeting. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that when somebody says, oh, let's cover immigration and let's go into the Latino community, somebody's going to stand up and say, the Latina hopefully will say, excuse me, but most of our people were born here. So you need to go into a different community. Yeah, that, that's a really, for me, a difficult question to answer because part of what I'm seeing is the many new ways that Latinas and Latinos can enter um, the, the, you know, enter, enter the world of news or the world of information media, and part of that is through these social platforms. And so, you know, and, and the shift that I've seen from the, val the, the value placed on um, on news and data shifting toward, you know, more of an entertainment, having more of an entertainment scope. So. There definitely has been some kind of opening of, um, of this very uh, elite world that perhaps didn't exist before. Um, but that said, to reach those higher ranks and to reach those positions of, um, of decision making that, you know, that, have, that, that impact the lives of so many people beyond the Latino community, I still see as that being very unreachable for a lot of Latinas. And I think that part of it is, like you guys are saying, is making sure that there's people at all levels um, holding each other's hand because you know, at some point there's, 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 this, this industry is in such um, uh, revolution that, um, that, that changes happen at the top very quickly. You know, they, they happen all throughout the business very quickly. I also think, though, it's a very empowering moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, information is in the hands of consumers. And so the social platforms allow for people to actually create content, to share content, to curate, mm -hmm. to be in communities, to use devices and platforms that actually um, begin to now reflect who we are in, in more authentic and, and meaningful ways. So we're still challenged, I think, in the traditional media companies. Mm -hmm. But when you look at all the bloggers, the influencers, the social networks, it's, it's multi-language, it's multi-generational. 
And I also think that this is a very empowering moment for people to understand that you can actually use these tools to begin to change the narrative. You don't have to wait until you know, large media institutions you know, figure out ways in which they can do it. And so I think the, the blend between an empowered you know, community using technology and communication tools and devices is going to start to change because mm -hmm. people understand that you know this is. And the last thing I would say is, um, you know, media is a it's a profession where you can marry you know your sense of purpose and passion mm -hmm. with a profession. And so many journalists go into this because they have this keen sense of wanting to improve the world, to mm -hmm. change the world, to use these um, communication true. tools to actually empower. And I think for Latinas in particular, it's a fantastic space to be mm -hmm. in. Shirley, so let me continue kind of, you, you know, you mm -hmm. touched on it here. So in speaking about media, would you say then that digital, digital platforms, digital spaces have the most flexibility right now to be able to get in, get your foot in the door, and then be able to move around once you're there? I, mean, I, that's I, I think so. I think so because, um, you know, and I started on print media many years ago and then made the transition. And, you know, I remember having to have a certain, you know, there was a sense of like that you had to master so many things in terms of critical thinking, in terms of the way you amassed information and data, and being able to, you know, tell that story and then learning the craft of storytelling. There was so much you needed to you know, um, to understand and, and, and coalesce around the publication of a piece. And now what I see is a lot less emphasis on having that understanding and a lot more emphasis on just tell the story, get it out there as soon as you can. Um, and, you know, and that's for better or worse a lot, the way a lot of publications are now working. And, and there's a lot of resistance within these organizations because they don't want to see, um, they don't want to see the, the value of, of of um, interpretation being diminished, and, um, and and neutrality, and so. But to answer your question, yes, I think there's a lot more opportunity now. There's a, you know, especially at these lower levels of media to come in and 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 not necessarily have um, the background that was once expected. And that is, I mean, that, and that, and there's some ways that that's good because it allows a, a variety of people to come in to tell stories and to get their story told or to tell other people's stories. But in another way, we have to be careful to make sure that we're, you know, um, sharing the important, the important pieces of journalism, which is accuracy and neutrality, and being objective and telling the truth ultimately and bearing witness. All right, Michelle. Let me ask you: Do you think it's possible for strong, established media services to prioritize diversity for it to be more than just wishful thinking? Yes, we do it. We have some in our newsroom to really make it a focus, to really make it a priority. Is, that, is it possible? I think it is possible, and I've, I've seen it happen um, when Sharon Rosenhaus was the uh, managing editor at the South Florida Sun Sentinel. She was absolutely committed to making sure that the staff of the paper reflected the South Florida community. That meant hiring more Latinos, more African Americans, more Asians. It was a program that she had brought from uh, the paper in San Francisco, where she had uh, been the managing editor for a number of years. It was successful there. It was successful in South Florida. And we saw our numbers go from, I would say, uh, mid-teens for uh, journalists of color and to um, the mid-20s wow. um, within a matter of a year and a half or two years. So with a commitment from the top, <clears throat> it's possible. Mm -hmm. Michael, let me ask you about um, the benefits of media outlets that are solely focused on Spanish language as their way to reach their viewers, to reach their audience, to reach their readers. Yeah, well, I grew up in Spanish language media, of course, um, publishing La Opinión first in Los Angeles, and then we went national, and we were in 10 of the largest Hispanic markets with Spanish language media. And the beauty of it, of course, is that that is who you are. And so everything you do, the way you cover issues, you bring to it a Latino perspective. You're not just covering Latino issues, because as we've heard before, there's no such thing as just a Latino issue. But how you go into City Hall, how you cover the major institutions, you're just thinking constantly about 
what does this information mean for my community and how do I convert it into actually something that becomes a tool for empowerment? Mm -hmm. So there was, I can remember over the years, you know, people, oh, well, you're all, you know, it's about advocacy journalism. And you know what? It's public service journalism. It's knowing who your audience is and it's doing what's right for them. Mm -hmm. And if it turns out that you're advocating, so be it. Because at the end of the day, we have an important responsibility to use our networks, our, um, our capacity to really empower communities. Now that is very different than those organizations that have to serve a more general market. And, and Latino media, Spanish language media, is transitioning. It's not about Spanish anymore. It's about content, and content that is relevant and that speaks to the issues that people care about. Because as we've heard earlier, the majority of um, US-born Latinos are English speakers, obviously. So that is the next generation. Would you all say that there is a set of, or a skill set, I should say, that you would say, get this under your belt ASAP? You know, learn this trait as quickly as you can in order to, you know, kind of a story of if I knew now or if I knew then what I know now, maybe things would have been different or maybe I could have shaved some time off of, you know, the trials <laughs> and, and all of the effort, right, in the career. But would you say if you can do this, master this now, what would it be? I would say for me, um, I wish I had taken a statistics class <laughs> <laughs> okay. in college. Um, because so much of um, so so much of the way that we're telling stories today on the digital side and, and on print also um, has to do with you know with metrics and with analytics and learning to use a lot of the platforms are out there like Google Analytics or Omniture, which is a much clunkier one, or um, Parsley. There's so many great platforms out there, and what I find is that. Um, for me, you know, the numbers take a long time for me still um, to, to, to look at them and to interpret them. And it took me a while to become comfortable with spreadsheets and, you know, that, right. that and then, but then the fun part, the rewarding part for my, for my, the journalist in me is interpreting that data, fact checking it, and then telling a story and then fact checking that story. And, um, and so I, yeah, I wish that I, that I had done that. And I would say that, and then the, sort of the old school, but the old school, um, you know, the previous tech uh, talent that I would say is just, you know, developing that ability to stay present when you're in the, when you're, you know, when you're, when you're reading a number, when you're reading just either a story or interviewing one, I think that that becomes that level, the power of observation mm -hmm. still reigns supreme, I think, in, in, in no matter what industry, and, and I think developing that as a, as a skill today still really matters. We talked a little bit in our previous um, panel about reaching out to somebody and if you think you've got their ear to hang on to them, right, so that you can ask those questions and don't get discouraged if you don't get an email, you know, two days later, three days later, maybe even a week later, it takes some time. But how do you establish mentorship in the workplace to extend the hand, to pull up, and to keep that door open? Are there, are there groups that need to be set up, or is it simply having these one-on-one -on -one discussions with um, colleagues, with those that are coming in? How do we establish the mentorship in the workplace? Or is it maybe as simple as, you know, sometimes it's not convenient to make yourself available. Right. Um, but you have to if we want things to change, right? right? Um, one of the things I've done is that I, I, I'm, like, I have this very strong inner rebel and I love when you know, and I love when it's 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 women, especially young women or men, but women, Latinas who um, who don't have the background that would have ordinarily gotten them in the door. I'm constantly on the look for that, and I make sure you know I share I talk about that because I want to make sure that my colleagues also keep that in mind yeah. when they're hiring or you know anyone I'm working with, and I'm I'm looking for the desire. So so essentially it's. You know, anyone who puts themselves in front of me, even if it's a connection to someone I know, or, you know, there are many ways to help really transition someone along their journey. And, um, and it's literally where there's desire and the will, I think that, that you know, that 
I'm, I, I love like, you know, sharing what I have because it allows me also to learn, you know, to learn how to update my own knowledge and my own way of helping. And I think that um, I talk about that a lot at work and the need to help each other, especially in environments that are really stressful, because that's like one of the first things that goes out the window is remembering to help um, el prójimo. So, you know, that, that's one way for me is to just be on the lookout for me to be alert and giving back. I want to go to the audience now. So if you have been thinking, I want to make sure that we have a couple of minutes for some questions. So if you've got some questions that are specific or general, that's fine. Um, love to see you raise your hand. And we'll come to you in the front row, please, first. Hi, Monica Gonzalez with Vista Strategies. And Monica, I know I've known you for quite a long time. And you've um, been such a trailblazer and a leader um, on corporate boards and other forums. How do you handle adversity? What's your advice on dealing with adversity? Oh, that's a great question, Monica. Um, how do you handle adversity? Um, I keep it very private. You know, there were some women that were on the earlier panel that talked about, um, you know, how it is that you sort of manage your image. Um, I think it was Geisha who was talking about it. And I very often, you know, try to just understand what happened, internalize it at the moment, go back and reflect on it, and lessons learned. Um, but I do recognize that when women show weakness in the moment, it's interpreted in a different way than if it was a man that had to go through something. So I am very stoic. I hold it in. I go back and I reflect. And then I learn from that and then try to adjust going forward. But there is something about you know, demonstrating um, what could be construed as a, a sense of weakness um, among your coworkers, among the people that you're reporting up to. And so I think um, you know, it's just one of those things that you try to you know, learn from mistakes, um, overcome them in whatever way you can. But I am very careful about protecting my image um, among those who I think have um, the authority or the opportunity to actually make a determination if I'm going to go up or I'm going to go sideways. Anybody else in the audience? Another question? Yes, over there. I see you. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much. This panel has been very informational. Um, following up with your uh, conversation about image, it's very important for us to market ourselves. So what is the best way for Latinas to market ourselves? Obviously, when you have the skill set, you prove yourself in the mm -hmm. workforce. But as Latinas, there's always that, um, there's always that I don't know, from, especially from other groups, um, that they tend to undervalue us. Mm -hmm. So how can you, um, how can Latinas learn to uh, market ourselves so that we can rise to the top? I think it's really important to project confidence, to be confident in yourself, to be confident in your skills, to be confident in what you can do and in your interactions with others and what you bring to the table. You're not. Everybody has strengths and weaknesses, but to know what your particular set of strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. are, I think, helps uh, when you're putting yourself forward into the marketplace. And of course, those strengths and those skills are always changing, um, depending on circumstances, and you, you gain new skills over time. So you have a better sense of how you can convince a company or a client that you are the best person for that job. The only thing I would add to that, too, is that, um, you know, I think many of us have a tendency and, you know, we're such hard workers, we're at it, we sit at our desks and we want to complete the project and we want to be like good young workers or good, good workers. And I think it's, um, for me, remembering to, to put that aside, you know, almost to calendarize that and to regularly get out and, and connect with other people. and you know, to find opportunities where I can promote what I've learned or discuss what I've learned. And, and you know, and, and it's, you know, you're talking about confidence, and it's like, yes, let, let me be confident enough in my skills that I can put, like, my day-to-day -day aside and get out and do something different and, and step away from the work um, to grow. Because that's essentially how I'm going to keep, you know, ri you know rising in, in, in the corporate workforce or wherever it is. Um, so... Yeah, it's nurturing that piece of yourself and remembering that. Let me also that. add to that that it may be difficult 
you know, to be that introspective and to self-analyze and because maybe you think, because of our humble backgrounds, I don't want to say that about myself. Right. Sit down with somebody that you are confident or that you can trust, that you can have some honest mm -hmm. conversations with, a mentor that you can say, can you help me? I think, this, I think these are my strong suits. It's hard for me to see them when I look in the mirror. Can I hear what you would think or what you would say? And have, be able to ask for help. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't know the answer, and it's hard to sometimes say those things about yourself because you feel like you're gloating or, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay to ask for help and to, to, to hear it from somebody, somebody that's sitting on the opposite side of the table as you. I think maybe one more question, and then we'll go after that. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you so much for this great conversation. Um, Women in the media and what you're seeing now with the women's marches and the movement and the activity um, that's happening all over, not just the country, but the world. Can you talk a little bit about maybe your expectation or what, you, um, what your perception was after the marches in January as, um, you know, kind of this is your bailiwick in your wheelhouse? Anybody? <clears throat> well, I, you can, I think a big difference between the marches in the 60s and 70s and the marches today is the marches in the 60s and 70s had a plan to connect to power. It wasn't just about turning out numbers in the streets. Mm -hmm. And then there was somehow an expectation that things were going to change. There was pressure put on elected officials. There were people who ran for office. There were people who, um, who wrote letters. There were consciousness raising groups in order to empower ourselves and each other. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing that mm -hmm. now. Um, and that, I think, is um, a, a significant disconnect. And we need to really, we have the numbers. We've demonstrated we have the numbers. Um, now we need to hold people accountable and say, OK, this is who we are. We elected you, and we cannot elect you too. I just wanted to, it's not specific to women or to the women's marches, right. but I've reflected a lot on this question of changing the narrative, mm -hmm. um, whether it's around women's issues or Latino issues and where we find ourselves today um, in you know, 2017. And you know, when over two thirds of all Latinos say that mainstream media does not reflect who they are as a community, and yet it is that imagery that is being absorbed by others who then create you know, a, a sense of um, understanding or misunderstanding. So I think we have a real obligation right now to really interface directly um, with media and to use it as a way to mm -hmm. begin to change the narrative, mm -hmm. to understand that, in fact, we are empowered. And we can begin to. Um, redefine the way Latinos are perceived in this country by using these tools of, of media and communication. It's an extraordinary opportunity when there's such a misalignment. Mm -hmm. That creates an opportunity. And I think lots of companies are trying to figure out, how do I actually begin to understand, reflect, and communicate who Latinos are in America and what we mean to this country going forward? And I would use this as an opportunity to take those tools and, and use them for an empowerment. Se nos acabó el tiempo. We got it. Monica, Shirley, thank Michelle, you. we thank, thank you. you so very much thank for you your time much. and your thank insight. You. Thank, you. thank you very much for your questions. That's our panel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ladies, for such a powerful conversation. This brings us to the end of the program this morning. On behalf of The Hill Latino and our sponsors, PG&E and Telemundo, I would like to thank all of you in the room and those of you who tuned in to the live stream. If you missed any portion of the discussion, the full event video will be available on thehill.com shortly. And please continue to follow The Hill Latino online and through social media. As a reminder, please be sure to fill out our event feedback survey. You can hand your forms to any member of The Hill staff on your way out. Muchisimas gracias. <laughs>